I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about whether video games can treat ADHD. So in June of 2020, just about six months ago, the FDA did approve a game called Endeavor RX for specifically treating kids in the age group of 8 to 12 with ADHD. This is a prescription-only product. It's a product that you need an iPad or iPhone to work with. And essentially, it's a multitasking video game. And this is a pretty significant declaration by the FDA because it's the first time, not just that a game was approved for treating ADHD, but that a video game was approved for any indication. Now, the group that developed this project, this game is called, and I may be butchering the pronunciation, Akili Interactive, a University of California, San Francisco professor. So I actually had no awareness of this till I did some research. He's literally just a few miles from where I live and work. Dr. Gisele has spent a few decades now doing basic science research. He has appointments in neurology and psychiatry. So he's doing basic research using technology, using game technology, using sophisticated brain measurement approaches to try to develop essentially video games to improve not just the brains of people with ADHD, but a whole host of conditions, including autism, Alzheimer's, and looking to improve functioning in normal people. So to boost all of us to our maximal intellectual maybe emotional capabilities as well. This is significant. FDA has never before approved a game for any indication. Keeley, I guess, does have other projects in the works that will soon be, they hope, approved for other indications. The FDA has a very well-established, extremely rigorous, extensive protocol for getting drugs approved. You have to do tests in small numbers of healthy people to prove that it's safe. Then you do larger scale tests in much bigger numbers of people, not just to show that it's safe, but to show that it's clearly more efficacious than placebo control group. Hopefully it's big enough and long enough to catch any adverse effects or side effects or problems of treatment. The approval for devices is much less rigorous. It's much more, they say, skewed towards the industries that either make medical products or including now video games. Less extensive data is needed to show that this is okay and not harmful for kids. The group behind this product has done other studies. I had trouble, for, it sounds like most of them have not been fully published. So in their claims, they say that some of their video game products have been shown to improve multitasking ability in individuals, improve working memory, improve aspects of attention, ability to shift attentional focus, so flexibility and attention, all of which would be great things to have for helping people with ADHD. Indications were to suggest that this may be part of treatment for children with ADHD. They are not proposing or suggesting that this is a game that's just going to make all medications and all behavioral and therapeutic interventions unnecessary. So this is not just throw your kid in front of a video game and your ADD is going to be gone. This is intended as part of a more comprehensive program. Kids they tested this in were an 8 to 12-year-old group. About three-quarters of them were boys, or two-thirds, three-quarters, somewhere six seventy percent About 348 kids were actually in the official study that I saw posted, more were screened. So the kids had to have ADHD on standardized measures. Not only did they have to have ADHD, they had to have performances on the TOVA. TOVA is a test of variable attention. It's a test that was developed probably 40 years ago almost and is available in a couple of formats. It's a objective measure of attention. Kids had to be deficient in this measure of attention to get into the study, which is, if you're not showing deficits to begin with, it's harder to show improvement for an intervention. But that also may mean that this is selectively, we don't know how representative this is of the whole ADHD population. So it's particularly kids with inattentive aspects to their ADHD. 
there were some kids who were on medication before the test, but it's not a huge group. And they were actually required to stop their medication several days before the beginning of the test. Now, the test was to teach them how to play this video game and then to have them practice playing the video game. And the practice was five sessions a day, five days a week for four weeks. So that is 100 sessions. That is more than 40 hours of video game playing in a four-week period. That is more than two hours a day every weekday. Some encouraging things that they made the game fun enough and interesting enough. And I had trouble finding out exactly what the game is. Descriptions are that it's a video game using again an iPad or iPhone framework that involves multitasking. So two different tasks are going on and you're being trained to sort of focus on the important task and not distracted by other variables that are ongoing. So the encouraging thing is that they had about 83% compliance. So even though this is a lot of testing, a lot of time on one video game and the video game is a progressive one so that you, you know it gets more difficult as you get better at it not just a static do the same thing over and over again so 83 percent compliance particularly in a group of kids with adhd who can get distracted or frustrated or just stop playing for other reasons pretty high rate of continuing with it and at the group level there were robust differences between the group of kids the control group was given a different video type game, had not been designed to improve attention. So at the end of the study, looking at the TOVA again, which is an objective way of measuring several different aspects of attention, group who got this Endeavor RX game or played this game were measurably better as a group than the placebo group. This was a double blind study, so kids and their parents. And the researchers, nobody knew which treatment group a kid was in. How well individuals did, that's a little less, I would argue, less impressive than the very robust group findings in the TOVA score. 35 to 40% of individuals met their criteria for substantially improved on their attentional score, but about 25 to 30% of kids in the control group also improved TOVA score to a range that was considered good or within normal range. So what does that say? One is that there is a placebo effect or a reversion to the mean that the kids were doing better in both control group and in the test group. It was a robust statistical difference that many more kids in the Endeavor RX game group improved. More than half of the kids didn't reach that criteria for substantial improvement. None of our treatments, medication, behavioral, anything in any branch of medication work absolutely for everybody. So this is a robust finding. It was a multi-site investigation. So it wasn't just one group of researchers in one place. So it was generalizable and that they didn't find gender differences, site differences in terms of success rates with this. They also did some rating scores and at least on some rating scores, parents of the kids who had the Endeavor RX game or played it, slightly more of those parents thought their kids were doing better with attention measures. Kids' self-assessment was also higher, although the statistical significance of the groups wasn't robust there. There's a ADHD rating scale, rating severity of the ADHD ratings overall. There wasn't a difference before or after. One of the big questions of, because there have been other groups with other project products, both video games and biofeedback tools and protocols were able to demonstrate people have improved on a certain laboratory test situation. But the question is, is this generalizable to real behavior in real life? Rating scale not changing substantially either says maybe our rating scale isn't capturing what's significant or meaningful about severity of ADHD. Or again, maybe this narrow improvement in a certain ability isn't that impactful for changing someone's life with ADHD. So a little bit more about the TOVA, the test of variable attention. So again, it's a test that was developed, I believe, in the 60s. Fairly simple in concept and design. There's lots of people who have their slight versions of it, but they're 
our standardized criteria for doing this test. The test is as simple as using a computerized apparatus, flashing a two different targets in sequence. So just one at a time in front of a person. And often it's a square with a square superimposed at the top of it. If it's a target, this person's supposed to click. If it's not the target, if it's the wrong, the non-target, the wrong thing, the respondent is supposed to not give any response. First half of the test is sort of the boring situation test where there's fairly long pauses and that the majority, three and a half times as many of the items shown are the non-target. So most of the time the person is withholding and not responding and sort of waiting every three, four times. And again, these are randomly distributed to click on the target. The second half of the test is sort of a more stimulating situation where the ratio is reversed. So three and a half times as many targets in this one as non-targets. So the person's clicking more often because they're seeing the target. What's being the standard version is a visual test on the computer, but there are also auditory tests where one tone figure, you know, a A note, that's the target you're supposed to click on. And if you hear the low note and they're not supposed to, you're supposed to withhold response. And the same first half, the test is boring. Lots of non-targets don't click on that. Second half, lots of targets supposed to be clicking. And there's certain measures. The omission measure is how often the person is missing because they're getting bored with not seeing the target and just completely missing it when it flashes on. So the emission rate is how often you're missing that target. And that's a good measure of attention. The commission rate is how many times you make an error. You hit the non-target when you shouldn't have because you're over-eager and jumping. That's used as a measure of impulsivity. There's also standardized ways of measuring the reaction time to see how quickly and attentive people are. Also, the variability in reaction time to see how whether people are drifting off in terms of how attentive they are with time. Parts of your brain are monitoring whether you're making errors, whether you're even consciously aware you made errors or not. But there's a post-error response rate measure to see how well your, your brain is tracking whether you're making mistakes and how much you're delaying in response to that. What we still don't have a good handle on, though, is how well it really captures what's important for kids with ADHD. And again, clearly the Endeavor video game product showed robust improvements on the COVA for a substantial number of kids, not at all. But the big question is, how well is this going to translate into real-life working improvement in the lives of kids with ADHD? Secondary question or issue is if you do your 40 hours of video training, have you improved your brain for life on the COVID test or maybe in the bigger world? Is it an effect that wears off with time? Other issues related to this is every intervention we, we make has side effects. We often just focus on the evils of medications, which many of them, particularly stimulants we do use for ADD have certain risks of very serious side effects. Pretty tiny numbers of people reported issues with frustration, headaches, dizziness, and low is less than 5% of kids. One of the research involved in the study that points out that, and this wasn't formally measured as a side effect, one to think about is they made the game so fun and compelling, it's hard to get kids disengaged from that. Does your kid really have two hours, two plus hours every day for a month to spend on a video game rather than on homework or rather than on games he was already playing in light playing. Talk a lot about the addictive potential of stimulant medications, but are we actually in a better place? And I'm not saying that we've shown this, but let's say video games that are really good at treating ADHD, but they're so powerfully addicting that kids are spending hours every day of their lives for years after playing these wonderful video games. I mean, I don't think it's likely to be that severe or that bad, but maybe for some kids it will. So we shouldn't dismiss the idea that our non-pharmacologic interventions may have side effects, including serious side effects. So stay healthy, stay sane in this strange world, and I'll be back next week. 